Hello everybody! I know this is not an ideal way to do a presentation, but now on the bright side you can listen and learn to the wonders of the sensory perception in Sarno's moles from the comfort of your own home. So let's begin. I'm Hannah. And I'm Miranda. Uh, so just a bit of background here before we dive into uh, the Sarno's moles sensory specific capacities. Um, the scientific name is the Condylura cristata, and of the 39 species of uh, moles that uh, are known, this is the only one that is found in moist, uh, low areas such as wetlands, and it's mostly in the northern parts of northern North America. Um, once it's fully grown, uh, it reaches a size similar to a uh, rat, and it is uh, functionally blind, although uh, they are known as somatosensory specialists, which we will uh, further explain in the next slides. Um, they're also known as the fastest foragers among mammals, and they mainly eat insects, worms, and small fish. All right, so here's just kind of a visual difference between the sternose mole that we are talking about and an eastern mole. So very similar in terms of body, basically. The only main difference is the nose. As you can see, this one's got the star appearance, and this is a very small, like, I guess a moon round appearance. So as Miranda hinted at, the sternose moles are functionally blind, but it does not mean that they are 100% blind, as they can still detect the presence of light and movement using the rods in their eyes. But they are, in fact, colorblind as a result of the lack of cones and they can't differentiate between the different wavelengths, whether it be red, green, or blue, but they can detect if there is the presence of light in general. And they have small eyes and a tiny optic nerve, which limits the amount of information that can be sent to the brain for processing. So to make up for these inhibitions, these sternose moles have adapted their specialized star nose and their sense of touch to interact with their dark underground environment. So the concept of cortical magnification uh, is fairly common among species. As you can see here um, in the human homunculus, um, there are different uh, proportions of the somatosensory cortex that are devoted to different regions of the body, um, and typically larger portions of the brain are dedicated uh, to sensory processing of body parts which require uh, more detailed perception. Um, so the uh, density of the actual sensory receptors on a surface uh, determines the amount of cortex which gets devoted to that specific organ based on um, the requirement of information regarding fine details. Um, of that specific lo location of the body. All right, so basically, as you can see here, we have a, the nose itself is a touch organ, so it has these fleshy rays arranged symmetrically around the end of the nose, and each of these fleshy rays are known as tentacles, and there are 11 of them on each side, so there are 11 pairs that make up 22 in total. They act like the eyes for the mole to help sense the environment. And on each of these tentacles, there are in fact over 25,000 sensory receptors known as Imer's organs. And just as a fun fact, the number of Imer's organs on each of the 22 tentacles has actually double the amount of touch fibers that are contained on a single human hand. So that just kind of gives you some perspective on the quantity of sensory receptors they have. All right, so this picture on the left is a really nice blow up just to kind of give you an idea of basically the appearance of each of these iris organs on this is just one tentacle. So each of these little domes is one of those iris organs. They are roughly 40 micrometers in diameter. And then the picture on the right here is a blow up of just an individual iris organ. And this dark brown area is the thin skin layer. And then just underneath you have the free nerve endings. So when the tentacles of the star nose come in contact with an object or prey in its environment, the shape of these imer organs actually change. 
contain Merkel discs and laminated corpuscles, also known as Ficinian corpuscles, which act similarly to the free nerve endings and basically pick up touch sensation, vibrations, and pressure and help send this additional information to the brain to give the mole more understanding. Uh, so as Hannah mentioned, uh, upon contact, the actual imer organs themselves um, do compress. Um, so through movement, they're more uh, spread out, as shown up here, um, whereas in contact, um, the actual tentacles um, will directionally uh, deflect in a specific way um, at the terminal neurites, at the apex of each column, and this information is all sent to the brain to help interpret uh, the type of object which it is in contact with. Um, the Starnell's mole is able to very quickly discriminate objects based on both shape and texture um, in the mole's environment. Um, so based on textures, as you can see here, um, rough surfaces uh, have the deflection pattern in opposition to one another, whereas in contact with smooth surfaces, uh, the tentacles will deflect into the same direction. Uh, so as uh, touched on earlier, uh, the cortical representation of the nose is um, much greater than the actual size of the nose in anatomical proportions. Um, and there is, in fact, uh, very small receptive fields and uh, processes of cortical inhibition, um, which enhance the acuity of uh, the nose in its uh, sensory abilities. Uh, the 11th pair uh, is the smallest, um, situated right at the center here, and it is known as the tactile phobia. Um, so when food or a possible source of food is sensed by any of the other 10 tentacles, the nose quickly shifts um, so that the 11th pair is focused on that object and it can be uh, further investigated. Um, the uh, large branch of the trigeminal nerve um, is served to innovate, innervate all of the 11 pairs of appendages here um, to the brain and connect them with the primary somatosensory cortex. Uh, so just have a short video here just to give you a, a bit more of a visual representation. Um, so you can see here uh, the mole kind of explores its environment, knows first, and uh, takes into, uh, very quickly takes in information about what it's uh, contacting, if it's something that uh, needs to be further looked at, or in this case, needs to be eaten. Uh, so just a bit of an aside here, um, the Starnell's mole is actually known as the world's fastest mammalian eater. Um, as you can see from that video, they have uh, very quick uh, jerky movements once they actually make contact with something that's known to be uh, edible to them. They can eat a worm in uh, approximately 120 milliseconds, and after only 8 milliseconds, the brain is able to uh, determine whether or not the object in contact is um, an actual source of prey and can be eaten. Um, so just as a bit of a comparison here, we did a, a quick Google search of the Starnos mole and it took uh, 0 0.6 milliseconds, um, sorry, 0 0.6 seconds for this, which is about five times as long as it would take for the mole to eat its dinner. All right, so most of our presentation has so far focused on the star nose in the moles itself as a sensory organ because most of the scientific literature focuses on that. But as we saw in a cortical map earlier of the mole, um, the representation is not only just the nose itself, but there's also the hands and the whiskers that help it sense its environment. So the whiskers themselves still make up a concern
considerable portion of the cortex, but not as large as the nose or the hands. And they help with tactile sensation to basically sense whether something is above it or below it, especially when it's in tunnels, and just to help give it a map of its environment. Uh, so also shown here um, in the cortical representation, uh, the forelimbs are uh, serve as a large proportion of the brain for touch sensation. Um, in comparison to other species of moles, um, their forelimbs are actually um, not as large um, compared to, um, for example, the uh, eastern mole. Um, but the paws and specifically the long claws um, are mainly used for digging in their underground habitat um, as well as swimming and moving through uh, thick mud underground in wetlands. Um, so they are serve some fine touch sensory uh, some serve as uh, fine touch, but they're mostly mechanical in their role um, in allowing the moles to explore their environment and maneuver their way through underground as well as in the water. All right, so another interesting feature of Sternos moles is the fact that they have the ability to actually smell underwater. So not only is the nose used for touch in its daily life running through the tunnels or dark, muddy underground, but when it enters the water, it actually, the nose serves as an olfactory organ. So the Sternos mole has the ability to blow out the air bubbles and suck them back in to basically carry the chemical odor and molecules from its environment back into its nose to be sent to the brain for processing. So it can help, I guess, give the mole an understanding if there's something in its environment that is worth further investigating, whether it be prey or an object. So here's just a video to kind of show you how it does this underwater smelling. So like in the tunnels, it still does the flexion of its nose to give it an idea of what's around it. And then it'll blow out bubbles and suck them back in. Blow another bubble, suck it back in. And there's another one. So that is our presentation for you guys. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to uh, comment on the discussion board below. And uh, thank you for listening.